Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I want to say thank you to XXXPAYNXXX, who left a five-star review of the podcast. I truly do appreciate that and thank you so much. If you like, you can support the podcast through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can do it for $3 a month and the various tiers have various benefits for you to enjoy. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday, and Canada's Great War, which releases every single Sunday. As well, on June 3rd, Thursday, I'm releasing my new podcast, Coast to Coast, which looks at the building of the Transcontinental Railway. I hope you enjoy it, and you can subscribe to it on all podcast platforms. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. Today I'm looking at the community of Chetwin, BC. As usual, when I look at a community's history, I won't be going through a chronological look, but rather looking at the various aspects of its history. So let's begin. The Indigenous. For centuries, the area around what would be Chetwind was home to the Beaver and Dene people, and they would call the area Little Prairie. Located near to Chetwind is the Saltu First Nation. Each year, the First Nation hosts Pemmican Days. The celebration originated from the role Pemmican played in Indigenous culture. Using the meat from bison, elk, bear, and moose, the meat was cut into thin slices and dried through a slow fire or in the hot sun until it was hard and brittle. It was then pounded into small pieces until it was almost a powder. That was then mixed with melted fat and dried fruits. And the mixture was then put into a rawhide bag for storage. Today, Chetwin sits on Treaty 8 land. The Founding of the Community The area that would become a town site existed primarily only as a trading post from 1918 until the early 1930s when homesteaders began to arrive. The area was first homesteaded in 1913 by Alexander and Lillian Windrum, who had cleared the land in order to plant gardens and crops that they could harvest. The area would grow slowly as settlers started to migrate in. The discovery of oil and coal nearby would help bring roads into the area, greatly increasing the amount of settlers who arrived. This would lead to the construction of the John Hart Highway, named for Premier John Hart, and completed in 1952. This would be the first major connection for the rest of the province. And prior to this, to get to the rest of the British Columbia, a resident of the area had to drive into Alberta. With the highway, the population began to rise. In 1951, the first school in the district was built, and on October 8, 1957, Little Prairie, as it was being called, was incorporated as a waterworks district. The railway would arrive in 1958, which I'll talk about in the next section. As for the name, that comes from Ralph L.T. Chetwind, who was the Provincial Minister of Railways. He headed the rail line project into the community, and he was rewarded with the community being named for him as a result. The official name change happened on July 1, 1959, with an official ceremony and the Canadian girls in training marching in a parade and singing a song about the name change composed by a local resident. Of course, the name change was not always welcomed by everyone. Sam Torrens, a local businessman, would say, quote, It really doesn't matter to me what they call it. We'll keep calling it Little Prairie. End quote. Prior to the name change, two petitions went up. One asked that the name change to Chetwind, and the other that it remain Little Prairie. The final tally had 100 votes in favour of keeping the name Little Prairie for every four votes in favour of Chetwind. The growth of the area continued through the 1960s as sawmills, oil and gas businesses, and more began to arrive. In 1963, the curling rink and rodeo grounds were built, followed by a library in 1967, a fire hall in 1968, an airport in 1970, and a hospital in 1971. All this growth resulted in Chetwind becoming a village in 1962. With mega-projects such as the Peace Canyon Dam, the Pipelines, and the Bennett Dam finishing in the early 1980s, the population of Chetwin began to level off, 
and it was reincorporated into the district in 1983 and lost its village status. By 1992, Chetwynd was such an important part of the forestry industry in the country that it was deemed the forestry capital of Canada by the Canadian Forest Services. The train finally arrives. Arguably the biggest day in the history of Chetwynd was in March of 1958, when 3,000 people gathered at the original site of the post office of Little Prairie, waiting for the arrival of the first train over the Pacific Great Eastern Railway from Vancouver. For many of the residents, the wait for the train had been 30 years since they first moved to the district, with the hope of a train arriving from the West Coast one day. The train would arrive carrying cars of pipe that served as the symbol of the natural gas development that fueled settlement in the community. Also in the cars were steel railway track that symbolized the continued extension of the Pacific Great Eastern, as well as a piggyback car with a Northern Freightways van representing the great freight hauling along the Alaska Highway. It also had cars full of grain and lumber to represent two of the biggest industries in the area. Premier W.A.C. Bennett was also on hand for the big event, and he touched off a gas flare that officially opened the new banking office in the community. Of the arrival of the railway, Bennett would say, quote, Today the PGE has arrived. It will bring great and undreamed of development to the north land of B.C., your faith in this country has been justified. End quote. Within the previous year of the community, with news of the train arriving, 18 new businesses were built. It was a good time for everyone, as exemplified by a local resident who was interviewed and stated in the newspaper, quote, We've had a great construction period. Wages have been high, and there's been work for everyone. We realize this can't go on forever, but the country has so much to offer, and with the new outlet of the PEGE, we just can't help but grow a little more all the time. End quote. After the big event and the train arrival, the town held a six hour barbecue complete with moose, venison, and duck, as well as dancing until 3 a.m. With the arrival of the railway, the lumber industry quickly began to grow, and with that, the local economy. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I've spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. The Little Prairie Heritage Museum Inside the community, you will find the Little Prairie Heritage Museum. This museum showcases the history of the area to the early trading post days when Chetwin was called Little Prairie. With the motto of celebrating community and pioneer life, the museum features artifacts and collections of the history of the railways, family life, farming, trapping, logging, and forestry. You can also find farm machinery that dates back to the early 1900s and was used by the first residents in the area. The museum also features artifacts from the building of the Alaska Highway, which was a major driver of change for the entire area of northwest British Columbia, when over 2,000 kilometers of highway was built through the bush in only nine months during the Second World War. I did an episode on that a little while back, and I encourage you to check it out. The Wooden Sculptures Easily one of the most interesting aspects of the district of Chetwynd are the chainsaw carvings. What started as the Rendezvous 92 Committee, which was created to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the construction of the Alaska Highway, the organizers wanted to leave a lasting legacy of the area's participation in that construction. On December 31, 1990, a meeting of major businesses and community groups was called, and it was decided to commission the creation of Bear Sculptures. 
In the first year of the project, 42 different fundraisers were held to raise money to bring the first carvings into town. These included baking cookies, hosting dances, and events driven around special guests who were brought into the community. With the bear sculptures complete, the carvings became a tourism centerpiece for the community. In 2005, Chetwin then hosted the first annual Chetwin International Chainsaw Carving Championship, which featured seven carvers from the United States and British Columbia. In 2006, 12 carvers came out from across North America. Today, carvers from across the world come to the community, including North Wales, Wales, and Japan. In 2008, the Echo Chainsaw Carving Series and Championship hosted an event in the community. The carvings that are now showcased in the community are now much more intricate with extremely fine details that come from individuals who know how to use a chainsaw like a fine blade. Today, there are 120 carvings that are located across the community. The W.A.C. Bennett Dam Located near to Chetwin, there's the W.A.C. Bennett Dam, one of the world's highest earth-filled dams. Construction began in 1961 and would continue for the next seven years, helping to fuel the growth of the community. In total, the construction of the dam cost $750 million, making it one of the most expensive projects in the history of British Columbia. Named for Premier W.A.C. Bennett, who played a major role in the construction, there was a significant controversy over the building of the dam as it would result in the creation of Williston Lake, named for Ray Williston, a member of the British Columbia Cabinet. Williston Lake was created at the dam as the Peace, Parsnip, and Finlay rivers all fed into it. With the dam now blocking flow, that lake began to grow, and as it grew, it covered 350,000 acres of former forest land. In addition, the creation of the lake also resulted in the relocation of 50 residents in the area, including members of the Tse K Dene First Nation. The indigenous residents lost their land that had supported them, and they became isolated from the culture they grew up with. Another issue with the creation of the dam was that it raised the humidity of the area quite a bit, which resulted in a compromised ability to grow crops. The dam and the subsequent lake also created cooler temperatures in the area and an increase in fog. Upon the dam's completion, Williston Lake was the largest freshwater body in British Columbia, running 250 kilometers north to south and 150 kilometers west to east. This makes it the third largest artificial lake in North America. Today, there is a visitor center located at the dam that overlooks Williston Lake, and it features exhibits on the dam, its production of electricity, and the area's cultural and natural history. The Hole in the Wall If nature is more your thing, you can visit the Hole in the Wall Provincial Park, which was created on June 29, 2000, and covers 137 hectares of land. Its unique name comes from the fact that there is a resurgent spring that emerges from the limestone rock wall. The water travels underground through caves and eventually works its way out of the rock to create this unique geological feature. Seeing the feature does not take a long walk through the wilderness either. It's located only 40 meters away from the road, making it easily accessible for travelers who are coming through the area. The area and the stream coming from the rock was also known by local indigenous for thousands of years. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Chetwin, BC. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randa McCallum, Diane Wade, Lorianne Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-E-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.